And so, Nancy, um, you were asking, uh, the conversation was about Green New Deal and, and trying to be observant and make sure that it's handled properly. And I was saying, um, currently, we don't even have 20 million electric vehicles on the globe. And yet, at the same time, we have 1.2 billion internal combustion engines. And so if we even think of trying to replace half of the internal combustion engines with electric, that's a whole lot of mountaintop removal and extraction and toxic processes and, and, and to be all honest, uh, slave labor or, or wa labor at slave wages without safety protections. That's a whole lot of problems in and of itself. And so I, I have taken the approach, it's less about changing over to solar panels and electric cars and more about lowering our needs and, and our level of consumption. And that's what's so challenging or so, so interesting about what's happening right now because people are getting a taste of what it means to live without the heavy consumptive lifestyle and, and the high energy demands. And then Paul wanted to jump in and, and say something on that too. Uh, yes. Um... So I'm a big fan of what I think every climate scientist knows is needed, uh, that the wealthy countries uh, need to find other things to live for uh, than producing and consuming material goods. Uh, happily, no one is really enjoying it in America. Uh, uh, the financial security of our working families uh, has been deteriorating rapidly. So I don't think that's going to be a hard sell. But I did want to say um, I've used several simulators. Uh, the latest one that Michelle introduced me to from uh, MIT about you know what do how low can we get a global temperature rise by making various changes. Um, I do not think it's going to be either or. I don't think it's going to be well. We won't focus on shifting to renewable energy. We'll just simplify our, you know, uh, the way we live. I think that's very important, but I think we're going to need to do it all. Uh, one of the brilliant things in the Green New Deal is that, you know, the, the public investment it's talking about, that will create economic activity, but it will create activity in the economy where working people live. What a lot of people don't understand is that our GDP doesn't mean what it used to. A GDP used to mean something about things being produced that might have value. Now it is mostly uh, an index of how much is being taken out. Uh, there's an economist named William Lazenick who writes brilliantly about that. Uh, if you look for profits without prosperity, um, in the Harvard Business Review, best thing uh, for sort of understanding where we're changing from, uh, what, our, what our status quo really is. But um, so anyhow, I think it's going to be both and, um, not either or, and that we can change our relationships with countries that supply materials. Um, so that's, that's my thought on that. This is a very nuanced problem because if we look to solar farms or offshore wind farms to keep feeding a national grid, that keeps putting the power in a centralized authority as opposed to putting solar panels on every roof and letting people disconnect from the grid which brings the power and not just the energy power, but the political power and the economic yes. power into yes. the local community and cuts out the, the global corporations. You're again, you know, there's a lot, there's gonna be a lot of pushback. So this is what I would look for in any Green New Deal is where's the power shifting? Where's the money going? Is it going back into communities or is it going to some corporate headquarters somewhere, who knows where? And so how do we keep it local? How do we bring it back into the local? So you know, right, the, the Sanders Green New Deal specifically invests all that money in creating publicly owned uh, renewable energy. 
Um, and the focus of that agenda on things like education and healthcare, you know, what, what Sanders wants to do, what AOC wants to do, what I want to do, what we need to do is to provide economic security, just assuring basic life requirements for every American. Uh, that by itself will shrink our economy in ways that will be very helpful to the rest of the world. I also want to say, I think the shift to renewables has to be really, we have to be very mindful of Africa. You know, right now the Chinese are pushing fossil fuel development in Africa. We could help our grandchildren so much uh, by investing in a, the kind of a distributed solar energy Peter or uh, Derek was just talking about uh, in Africa. There's a wonderful organization called Give Power that does pilot projects. You should all check it out uh, because that's a model of what we should be doing for Africa uh, in a big way uh, with, with the resources available to us through government, I think. If I could build on what you're saying, Paul and Derek, and, and to some extent, I think I may be speaking on behalf of the ideas my son Eric has been putting into the conversation, um, building on what you're saying, the, the, one of the challenges is a credible case has been made for the dramatic reduction in poverty that has gone along with the expansion of capitalism and profit making in the last several decades. It is actually quite remarkable the challenge then is how do you meet the security needs in a way that is not is both healthy, in fact, the phrase I use is and am committed to is meeting the needs of all by healing, not harming planet and people. Mm -hmm. And that there are ways of doing this. I'm putting out what we're talking about right now are the system requirements or design specifications for a livable future. Trying to understand how the material needs are met by renewal, for example, regenerative agriculture and deep recycling so that the material, so that we're reclaiming the materials we've already taken out of the earth rather than having to add to them and not lessening the physical or material prosperity of people and expanding it were really needed. And at the same time, shifting the misuse of those things that fulfill goaded greed, wants driven merely to keep the economy going and the profits going, to be able to let that go. And that we're saying the current experience is opening up the space for people to rediscover what is truly fulfilling and come up with aspirations, not just wants. One last little thing I wanna comment on, Francesca. I share a background of post-traumatic stress syndrome. Years of recovery in 12-step programs out of an alcoholic family and so forth. And my sense, the reason I ended up focusing so much on looking towards the future and the solutions and what's working is from that, we have a tradition of starting with problems and trying to understand the problems more fully. My experience is if we find solutions that really energize and excite us and then reverse engineer from those, what makes that such a great solution? Oh, it looks like this then these are the design criteria. We, it deepens our understanding of the problems. So we don't ignore the problems, but we come at them from a position of higher energy and hope and actually more insight because once we've seen a solution at work, then we really understand what is still getting in the way of that and we know where to target our energies for transformation. Thank you. Sorry for all the feline interference. Oh, here. No I, love problem. It. I love it. <laughs> no problem. No problem. And I think on that note,